Ms. Peterson, go ahead. Uh, Please you, state Chairman. your name for the record. Uh, for the record, Scott Peterson from the Minnesota Department of Transportation. And I do have here um, copies of a letter from Commissioner Zelli with his comments about Senate File 1060. If someone could dis distribute those to the committee members, I'd be grateful. Thank you. Thank you, uh, members. And um, first off, I'd like to start with uh, uh, expressing my gratitude to Senator Newman for his uh, inclusion of increased funding um, in the bill. I think it's a recognition of the additional uh, b uh, level of investment we need in the state highway system as well as in the local road systems to make sure that they're preserved in a uh, state of good repair and that we're able to at least uh, make some uh, modest improvements as we go along in our um, in our uh, construction program. And I also appreciate the fact that the also included is the appropriation of federal funds um, that are uh, available from the federal government this fiscal year, as well as the uh, governor's recommendation for federal funds in the next biennium. And we're also grateful that he uh, included a $3 million increase in the, in the aeronautics office appropriation for essential air, um, airport services across the state. We think that'll go a long ways to help modernize the service that those airports are able to provide. And then, of course, we're also uh, very grateful that um, he's also included in here several of the department's um, policy initiatives, including the, the bicycle uh, modernization bill that uh, Senator Dibble carried, as well as some of the um, more technical policy provisions that were contained in, in, the, in Senator Newman's bills. Um, we are concerned, however, with, that the bill uses uh, general fund revenue to increase funding for roads and bridges. Um, as you know, the governor proposed uh, revenue sources that are constitutionally dedicated. We think this uh, provides a more li reliable, dependable, and sufficient revenue stream that's needed to provide a economically competitive um, state highway system for the people of Minnesota. And we are concerned that the amount of new funding in the bill is insufficient to accomplish that, as well as the fact that the general fund, if history is any indicator, um, is uh, not a reliable source. Two and, minutes. Uh, pardon me? Two minutes. You wrap it up, please. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> goes Sorry, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> goes quickly. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll move quickly to a couple of the concerns, and, and I'll uh, surrender the microphone. Thank you. Um, we are concerned about the elimination of the passenger rail office, um, the change in the flexible funds, and the condition that would put some of our existing uh, agreements with locals in. Uh, the earmarks, of course, are a challenge because of the potential disruption that causes to our program, and the inclusion of the milk walk truck weight exemption and the additional damage uh, that to pavements and bridges that that'll do if, if that's enacted. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. Next up, uh, Commissioner Dolman and on deck, uh, Judge Shetman. Go ahead. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, Senator Newman. For the record, my name is Mona Doman. I'm the Commissioner of Public Safety, and I'm going to speak fast. But first of all, I'd like to thank you for your support of the work that we do at the Department of Public Safety. I truly respect and appreciate the difficult decisions you're faced with in meeting your targets as you work on this budget. I understand the compelling and competing interests for funding. Public sa safety is one of co government's core functions. At DPS, we are a state agency, but we have local impact on a daily basis to the people across the state of Minnesota and our public safety partners as well. Our proposals as originally presented support our shared, our shared commitment to keeping the people of Minnesota safe. Our prior proposals are our priorities, and I hope that you will reconsider and fully support and fund our budget proposal as it originally introduced. These strategic investments support the communities you represent and the ones that we serve. It is money well spent to keep Minnesotans safe. That is our core mission. There are several key investments that we proposed that were not included in Senate File 1060 that are concerning. Of concern uh, is the lack of funding for the ongoing maintenance of the new Minnesota licensing and registration system. We began rollout of the system in 2016. And I really want to emphasize here that we are not asking for additional dollars for the development of the system. Our request is for an ongoing funding source to maintain it. Without, the depart without it, the department will be limited in the ability for future enhancements as requested by stakeholders and this legislature. 
DVS is a fees-based agency, and so we don't have sort of this um, pot of cash lying around to try to figure out how to maintain the system ongoing. If a funding source is not secured, we will have to use development dollars for changes in the system, which will leave the entire project in jeopardy. A funding source is critical for this key backbone system that the state relies on to issue all of the millions of driver licenses and motor vehicle transactions for Minnesotans. This budget does not include the state patrol helicopter that the governor included in his budget. Our proposal updates the aviation fleet at the Minnesota State Patrol, making it safer, more reliable, and more efficient. The services provided by the State Patrol are not provided by any other entity or organization in Minnesota, and it is critical for Minnesota's public safety. Two minutes. If this investment is not made, the State Patrol would only have one helicopter and we wouldn't be able to provide critical uh, resources to our local partners. Um, under current statute, the department is required to publish the summary, uh, summary and analysis of crash records. The department uses, used federal funds to improve a crash records management system, which began, became fully functional in January of 2016. If our proposal for ongoing funding to maintain the system is not secured, we can't meet our statutory obligations. And lastly, we included funding in our budget proposal to support our current operations um, at current funding levels in our agency. Senate File 1060 does not fully fund this request. Simply put, funding for the agency has not kept pace with the rising costs, which jeopardizes our ability to ensure that we have enough staff and operating funds to adequately provide our department's required services and support to the public safety partners and all of the citizens that we serve. Thank you again for hearing my testimony. We look forward to working th with you throughout the session. Thank you, Commissioner Doman. Uh, next up, Mr. Shetman on deck, Mr. Bentley Graves. Great, uh, thank you, um, Mr. Chair and members. I appreciate the opportunity to speak on Senate File 1060. Um, uh, there was a, a letter that was distributed just a, a few minutes ago uh, from our chairman, Chair Dunnick, related to the bill as well, so I'll try to run through this relatively quick. Uh, we have concerns that the bill does not recognize uh, transit in this, in this bill, and the, the fact of the matter is, is what that ends up leaving uh, uh, the Metropolitan Council Metro Transit is with about a $65 million budget shortfall for the upcoming biennium. And if we were actually having to uh, move forward with that shortfall, we'd have to cut our regular route bus service by almost 17%, and we would also lose about 17% of, um, of our riders in the process. Uh, this bill does not recognize the underperformance of MVEST. It does not recognize the growth of the metro mobility system, and it doesn't recognize the inflationary cost to our system as well. So we would be left with no other uh, ability to move forward other than to raise fares and to uh, and make uh, service reductions and service cuts to our system. Um, by not addressing metro mobility, we have no choice uh, because of federal law and state law that requires us to fund metro mobility that with just being left our general fund appropriation, we have to shift all of the costs of metro mobility onto um, the general fund and then that does not allow us to um, provide any additional service or even maintain the service that we have for metro mobility. I know we just have a few minutes or a couple minutes, so I'm going to jump down to a, a policy piece in this bill. It's in Article 5, Section 2 that ends the state's commitment to the 50% share of operating for the Southwest Line. Uh, this is a very difficult provision for us. Uh, what it seems like it's innocuous because the Southwest operating funds don't show up until the 20. Uh, 2022-2023 biennial budget, so the fiscal note on this bill shows that there's no state impact. However, our financial outlay for the project that we provide to our federal partners depends on that state uh, statutory uh, share uh, today. So this would effectively create a major problem for us and we would not be able to move forward with Southwest as it sits today because our financial plan would not would not work. But um, Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll stop there. The letter uh, does most of the talking and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, later if you'd like. But uh, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Shepman. Uh, next up, we have uh, Bentley Graves and on deck, Jason George. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Bentley Graves. I'm the uh, Director of Healthcare and Transportation Policy at the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. Just handed out to you just now was uh, a copy of a one-pager 
um, that we've worked on along with our partners in uh, the labor community, also uh, in the, uh, the transportation uh, industry. Um, and it outlines some of the principles, some of the, the funding sources that uh, uh, we believe can and should be used to put together a, a long-term comprehensive transportation funding bill. And I, I just want to kind of provide some comments uh, about the bill based on uh, kind of the approach that we've outlined in that, that one page. And first and foremost, I, I appreciate the efforts that the, the bill takes to bring some general fund dollars into uh, uh, the funding system for state roads and bridges. You know, we firmly believe that we need to broaden the base of financial support for that system. Uh, we're one of 34 states, or 34 states do use the general fund to support their state roads and bridges. Minnesota doesn't. So the, get, this gets us on the path to beginning to do that. We do think, though, that um, in order to make the best use of that, uh, it ought to be done in a way that can allow those funds to grow over time, and, and that isn't something that uh, uh, the bill does. Uh, so we'd, we'd encourage some additional conversation on that. We also believe that, that coupled up with that general fund uh, approach should be some uh, some increase in, in constitution dedicated dollars, and so we've suggested looking at uh, the TAB fee depreciation schedule and uh, would encourage members to continue thinking about that as well to kind of broaden out uh, the size and scope of the bill. Um, we'd also like to see some uh, some 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 uh, clear, some clear language in the bill about efficiencies to make sure that um, we're holding out in very clear terms that expectation for the department, which which is work the department has been doing. But we want to make sure that, that continues on in the future. Um, we appreciate the, the the extent to which the the bill does use the tool of trunk highway bonding, but um, would note certainly that if we're able to bring in more revenue from the from uh, tab fees or other sources, that um, that's something that could be broadened as well. Um, and then finally, um, want to just kind of note that uh, we do have some, some concerns, as Mr. Shetton just noted, about the impact that this bill may have on uh, particularly the regular route bus system um, and Metro Transit. Uh, understanding from the, the chairman's comments the other day about just kind of the uncertainty there and, and wanting to see how some of this plays out, certainly understand that. but would encourage some additional conversations, some additional looking at uh, how to solve that particular problem because the, the bus system is the backbone of our transit system and the transit system is something that uh, particular <laughs> employers in the metro area do rely upon um, to, uh, to ensure that their employees have options when it comes to uh, commuting to and from work. So um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to, to my colleague, Jason George from the, the 49ers and he'll be followed up by uh, Abby Braddock from the Associated General Contractors. Thank you. Thank you, go ahead, Mr. George. Mr. Chair, our committee members, my name is Jason George with the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 49. Represent about 14,000 heavy equipment operators in the state. Um, Carpenters Union, Laborers Union, and us are all signed on to the one pager that you see uh, ahead of you. We are largely the unions that build your infrastructure in this state. Um, and we support a lot of the comments, um, all the comments that Mr. Graves just made about the policy details of the bill. So I don't have much to add, be very brief. I just encourage you all to get this done. Um, a lights on bill is not gonna be good enough this year for anybody in this industry. Uh, we need certainty, our folks need to know that they have jobs, contractors, uh, we have 800 signatory contractors, all but 20 of them are small businesses with 20 or less employees um, all around this state. So I, I just looking, looking at all of you and I know there's some hard decisions to be made, there's some things that need to be done, you know, the, the, the bill I think is, is a good opening statement and I really appreciate the thoughtfulness of you putting this together and, and starting this conversation early. Um, but we really just implore you to get this done this year, a long-term funding bill, it, it, we need it to happen. So uh, that's all I'll leave you with, thank you. Thank you, Mr. George. Uh, next up, Ms. Breidach. Yes, thank you. My name is Abby Breidach, I represent the Associated General Contractors. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Minnesota, or the AGC is Minnesota's oldest construction trade association. We represent both union and non-union general contractors, subcontractors, and material suppliers. Um, many of you have seen the, the one pager we hand out. I say the part of that one page coalition. One pager coalition, I stand behind the comments that both Bentley Graves and uh, Jason George has made, have made. Um, but I want to add another perspective that we, we don't support, we are in this game not just for um, the jobs that would be provided, but as really those on the front lines of project construction project delivery in the state, um, especially in the highway industry, we feel that we know best um, in many cases, how to get the most value out of our construction projects and how to deliver those projects most efficiently. And one of the most important elements of that is to have stable and predictable funding. Um, a volatile and insecure funding stream 
really puts us in a place where we're not able to make the best choices about how we deliver the projects. It, it, it increases um, project costs and it, it really ha doesn't allow us to invest um, most efficiently in our workforce. And so we would encourage you to um, continue working. Again, we, we agree and thank you for this this good, um, thoughtful start to the bill process. Um, we'd like to see some, a uh, little bit more um, dedicated funding so that we can depend on that going forward. And we'd also like to see uh, the allowance of um, some of the transit um, elements to, to move forward as we um, go through the process. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Breidach. Uh, next up, Ms. Donahue and then uh, Mr. Grilly. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, for the record, my name is Margaret Donahoe. I'm the director of the Minnesota Transportation Alliance, and you should all have a handout as well. Um, the Minnesota Transportation Alliance is the oldest and largest coalition of organizations. Uh, we represent hundreds of thousands of Minnesotans all across the state who support action this year to increase funding and address the serious and growing transportation funding gap. As you've heard, there's a huge amount of support among all areas of Minnesota, business, labor, local government, safety advocates, manufacturers, agricultural interests, shippers, commuters, people in greater Minnesota and the Twin Cities are all expecting the legislature and the governor to maintain a safe and effective transportation system. Um, we've heard various proposals over the last few years, some more focused on transit, some more focused on highways, some that increase uh, taxes and fees, others that rely on one-time funding or bonding. Um, but the bottom line is that they have not been enacted into law. And in the meantime, the transportation needs are growing and the cost of projects is increasing. We really urge you all um, to look at putting together a package that is a combination of funding sources, including some uh, dedicated user fees along with existing revenue and bonding, so that we can have a funding package that will be enacted into law. Um, the Alliance does support dedicating the sales tax on auto parts. Uh, we believe that the $300 million per year that was contained in Senate File 990 more accurately reflects the level of funding attributable to that sales tax. We support transferring the $32 million from the general fund from the leased vehicle sales tax to transportation. We support the increased trunk highway bonding for corridors of commerce as long as the debt service level remains within the 20% of the trunk highway fund. Um, but we are very concerned about the lack of support for transit in this bill and believe that transit systems are a critical component of the transportation system all across the state um, and face growing demands and funding needs. Two minutes. We also have concerns about eliminating the turn back account. Um, but we stand ready to work with you um, and get a transportation <coughs> funding package that can be enacted into law this year. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Donahue. Uh, next up, we have Mr. Grilly, and then on deck, uh, Mr. Novak. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name's Dorian Grilly. I work for the Bicycle Alliance of Minnesota. I'm here today in support of, an, of the amendment that Senator Senjum intends to offer. That amendment would include the language from his bill, Senate File 1753, that authorizes the creation of a state-level active transportation grant program. It's the same thing that those of you who were here in 2012 did to create the state Safe Routes to School program. We're not asking that you include the funding portion of the bill that would have uh, dedicated the current sales tax paid on bicycles and bicycle parts, but we did think that was a good idea since this transportation funding bill includes uh, the dedication of the current sales tax paid on auto parts. We'd like you to think of this program as safe routes for everyone. It would focus on projects that help make walking and bicycling safe, a safe and easy alternative. The idea to create the state level active transportation grant program is not coming from the urban core. It's coming from communities throughout the state. And the sheet that I handed out shows the members of the Minnesota Mayoral Active Transportation Caucus. They see good walking and bicycling as an asset that will keep their community and its residents healthy. It will help them attract and retain young people, young families, and businesses. Communities throughout the state are doing this with their own paint and signs, but they need a little help with big projects like bridges over county and state highways, 
uh, a user activated crosswalk or a trail connection from the edge of town into town. The federal funds that MnDOT allocates right now don't come close to the need. So surveys including MnDOTs show that about three quarters of Minnesotans support including walking and bicycling in transportation projects. <laughs> so on behalf of the Minnesota Minnesota Mayoral Active Transportation Caucus, the Minnesotans for Healthy Kids, the Bicycle Alliance of Minnesota, and others, we hope that you'll support Senator Senjum's amendment. Thank you, Mr. Gurley. Uh, next up, uh, we have Mr. Novak. The mayors have canceled, uh, Mayor Castle and Mayor Hendrickson. So on deck is uh, Sherry Munyon. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you. Steve Novak is my name. I uh, handle transportation issues for the Minnesota Intercounty Association, which is four of the five suburban counties in the state and ten of the larger greater Minnesota counties. First off, I want to commend the chairman and the committee for a reasonably good start on what is a six, identified as a six billion dollar uh, ten-year challenge by both parties over the last uh, 12 to 18 months. Secondly, I want to speak specifically to a couple of sections of the bill where we do have concerns. Uh, one is the distribution of the money from the uh, sales tax on leased vehicles. Uh, we would prefer the uh, option that had been interjected by Senator Hall earlier in the, uh, in the session and hope that that will uh, remain under consideration as you work your way through this. Secondly, uh, I'd like to join with Ms. Donahoe and uh, say that we have significant concerns about the turn back uh, flex account section. Uh, the turn back issue uh, is very important to counties. I'll give you one quick example from Carver County uh, and also let you know if you're not aware that MnDOT is quite a bit behind in terms of its uh, payment to counties on a number of projects over the years where we're in partnership. But one specific example would be uh, the old Highway 101 Minnesota River Crossing in Carver County where uh, the county had to step in and advance millions of dollars, 10 million, to build uh, an above 100 year flood level uh, structure. Uh, they were anticipating repayment sometime in the 2020s and now the, the, they would have to wait an additional five or 10 years. Um, there are other examples just in Carver County, $4 million for uh, Highway 61 in downtown Chaska. Uh, $10 million for uh, the county share of 61 East. So I point this out only to remind members that we have these kinds of circumstances uh, throughout the state. Uh, the counties are in partnership with the state in good faith. We're concerned that the change in the bill in this particular turn back area will make a very tough situation even worse and want to make sure you're aware of that as you consider these things working through the process. Uh, I two have minutes. other comments, but I want to stay in my two minutes, so All I right. will uh, rest. Thank you, Mr. Novak. Uh, next up, Ms. Munyon, and on deck, uh, Ms. Finn. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Sherry Munyon, and I'm here on behalf of the Minnesota Public Transit Association, and we represent 47 Greater Minnesota Transit Systems, four suburban systems, and I have distributed a map of the Greater Minnesota Transit Systems so you can see the deep reach of transit systems throughout all of our counties. Uh, we are very concerned about the bill that is before you today in terms of the lack of funding for our bus providers across the state, particularly in the metropolitan area where harsh service cuts will be expected to take place. Whether it's Metro Transit, Suburban Transit, or Greater Minnesota Transit System, all these providers are working hard to meet the growing needs and demands from the citizens in their communities. We recognize that there is a slight increase for Greater Minnesota Transit, and while we appreciate that, we continue to advocate for the revenue from the lease vehicle, and that was 50% that we were seeking for Greater Minnesota Transit. That $16 million would have mainly gone for replacement capital investment, our bus purchases, and it would have also provided perhaps one or two bus garages that are under consideration, and the rest of it would have gone for our needs to expand and enhance service. And when we take a look at the revenue that's coming to Greater Minnesota, there are about seven urban systems. These systems operate very similar to in the Metro Transit. 
they have the same requirements for ADA as they do. So as we have an aging population, those services are important. And I'll close with that, but to say that by limiting the use of the lease vehicle revenue for the future, it's hard to see how the systems in greater Minnesota can maintain and grow. The way the funds are distributed, the only recourse for the future would appear to be seeking general fund dollars year by year without any long-term dedication. Thank you, Ms. Finan. And next up, Ms. Finn, and on deck, Mr. Huser. Good morning, Mr. Chair members. My name is Ann Finn, and I represent the League of Minnesota Cities. We're a statewide organization representing 833 of Minnesota's 853 cities. Minnesota cities, large and small, rural, urban, and suburban, support passage of an omnibus transportation funding bill that is comprehensive, multimodal, and sustainable. And with all due respect to Senator Newman, uh, we cannot support the proposed delete all amendment to Senate File 1060. I have two points to make today. First, the League's highest priority, highest transportation priority, is to secure a dedicated funding source for city streets that are not eligible for municipal state aid under the constitutional formula. These streets exist in both large and small cities. Currently, 84% of the city street system is funded with property taxes and special assessments. According to the 2012 TFAC report, the annual investment needed to bring city streets to an economically competitive condition is $400 million per year over the next 10 years. The one-time appropriation of $10 million for the small cities assistance account that this bill provides will simply not yield meaningful results. We do have a bill that we think is worthy of your consideration. It would provide $57 million per year in dedicated revenues to assist large and small cities with street maintenance and reconstruction. More than 200 cities have passed resolutions in support of this bill. Secondly, I mentioned property taxes. Money that flows through the constitutional formula disproportionately benefits the state and all of Minnesota's 87 counties. When the state and counties make investments in roads and bridges, there are almost always cost participation obligations for cities, and thus their taxpayers. Given that this bill provides very little in the way of new transportation money for cities, there's a strong likelihood that cities will divert funds from their own city street systems to meet cost participation obligations in state and county projects. Keeping up with the city street system will further burden property taxpayers. Um, lastly, we, we also recognize that this bill shifts money from the general fund and we have concerns that this shift may impact aids to cities that come from the general fund. We do stand ready to work with you to assemble a bill that will benefit all Minnesota communities and I thank you for allowing me to testify today. Thank you, Ms. Finn. Next up, Mr. Huser and on deck, Mr. Grubb. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, my name is Stephen Huser. I represent Metro Cities. Metro Cities represents 91 cities in the seven county metropolitan area. Thank you for the opportunity to share Metro Cities positions on provisions in the amendment to Senate file 1060. I'll touch on provisions of interest in the uh, amendment to Metro Cities as well as some concerns the association has with this amendment. Metro Cities supports provisions in the amendment to aid cities in addressing local street needs. We appreciate the increase to the municipal street aid MSA base included in the amendment. Uh, this am amount will help to address a portion of the city street need. Metro Cities will continue to support a higher level of funding to comprehensively address local street needs for cities in the region and state. While we appreciate the small city account funding is included in this bill, Metro Cities continues to support the creation and funding of a large city account to aid cities over 5,000 in population with non-MSA portions of their street systems. We also continue to support sustainable ongoing funding for these accounts. Metro Cities policy supports the sustainable and full funding of all modes of transportation that include road and bridge funding as well as funding for transit and is concerned with provisions in the uh, amendment that have implications for the provision of funding for transit and transit operations. Metro City's policies support funding them to meet both operational needs and strategic expansion of the regional transit system. We are concerned that this amendment will have a negative impact on the region's transit system operations and expansion. Metro Cities looks forward to working with the committee on these issues as this bill progresses this session. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Huser. Uh, next up, Mr. Group. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, thank you for affording me the opportunity to meet with you today. Uh, I'm here on behalf of Hennepin County and, and affiliation with the AMC also. Please state your name for the record, my, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. For the record, my name is James Grube. 
I'm the Hennepin County Engineer. I'd like to take a, a moment and uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I'd ask you to also, if you would, to reconsider a portion of the bill that's before you and retain the item commonly referred to as the flexible account, which is also referred to as the turnback account. Uh, you've heard from both Margaret Donahoe and Steve Novak already regarding the concept of retaining the turnback account. This funding in the turnback account provides uh, money to local government, in this particular case counties, so that we can either restore or reconstruct former state highways that have been turned over to the counties. If this money leaves the flexible and turn back accounts and goes into the trunk highway fund, there will no longer be any funding available to local government, in this particular case, counties, for the uh, restoration or reconstruction of state highways that have already been turned back to us. They are now our county roads and we use that turn back fund for that restoration or reconstruction. Two examples in Hennepin County. Old Highway 212 that goes down the bluff in Eden Prairie and Chanhassen. Uh, a previous testifier said that 101 was raised up out of the 100 year flood plain, uh, making it dry. On the other hand, the turn back of Old Highway 212 down the bluff leaves a portion of that old road eight feet below the floodplain level, and Hennepin County is responsible for raising the road eight to 10 feet. The plans are done. It's nearly a $60 million project. But we're awaiting uh, an understanding of if there will be money available for that project. A second project. Two minutes. At least I gave you one good project, at, and you know how your previous investment in raising 101 has gone unfulfilled because we must do County Road 61. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Chair. And just to follow up, and we can go into discussion later, but I believe the turn back money, there is money available in lines 420 through 432 that does appropriate money toward the turns back in a different way. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, next Mr. up, Chair. Uh, Ms. Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Dibble. Th those dollars aren't appropriated. They're simply made eligible out of the fund. Correct. Eligible. So, and it, that comes to about a hundred and over a hundred million dollars per per biennium. Ms. Sletton. Good morning, Chair Newman and committee members. My name is Jill Sletton, and I am the executive director of the Minnesota Association of Small Cities. Of the 800 and si 850 cities in Minnesota, more than 700 of those cities are 5,000. Uh, under 5,000 and under and received no state dollars for their city streets. Our small city streets are essential to the mobility and economic vitality of our communities and adequate funding for maintenance and reconstruction of our streets has remained unaddressed in transportation funding bills for over a decade. Senate file uh, 1060 does not provide for a dedicated and sustainable funding source that will relieve our city residents from the burden of higher property taxes and special assessments. For that reason, we cannot support um, this amendment. We understand the 10 million is a large number, but that doesn't begin to cover the cost of reconstruction and maintenance of our city streets. Our small city streets are used by more than just city <coughs> residents, as in the case of Oak Park Heights. Their city is less than 5,000, but increases to 20,000 during the day due to business and industry. And that occurs in many of our city st cities across Minnesota. It will cost some 6.5 million just for mill and overlay and 26 million for full reconstruction. The city of Winthrop, they don't have an exact dollar, but they do know that it will cost them millions to repair the four city blocks each and every year um, that would be paid for through their city, uh, city residents through property tax increases. The city of Kellogg with a population of 442 need approximately $1.5 million just to fix their streets that need immediate attention. This bill doesn't begin to uh, meet the needs that our small cities have to fix their city streets. Um, it is important um, for their commerce to move, uh, to provide the vitality and the stability to the future of their communities. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Ms. Slutton. Uh, next up, we have Mr. Dan Larson and Emily Pugh on deck. This will go straight forward to Ms. Pugh. Mr. Chair and members, Emily Pugh with the Association of Minnesota Counties. AMC is a voluntary statewide association representing all of Minnesota's 87 counties. First, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I'd also like to thank the committee and Senator Newman for making transportation funding a priority. At AMC, one of our top priorities has been to support a comprehensive transportation funding bill that includes new dedicated revenue for roads, bridges, and transit. We are concerned about the lack of support for transit in this bill. AMC has long opposed shifting of general fund revenue from other parts of the state budget to transportation. We are willing to support dedication of the auto parts sales tax to transportation as long as there is a surplus, surplus and the shift doesn't impact other parts of the budget. Given that, we support the bill's language that distributes the revenue from the sales tax on auto parts and has it flow through the highway user tax distribution fund. This fund has provided reliable funding that counties can plan for and has been good for distribution across the state. We do have significant concerns with redirecting all the funding from the Flex Highway account to the Trunk Highway Fund. You heard more about this from Hennepin County Commissioner Jim Group. This account has been used for turnbacks and in some situations roads have already been turned back and not paid for yet. We also have concerns with the policy language that it would increase weights for tr uh, milk trucks. These increased weights would cause immediate damage to our roads, further deteriorating infrastructure before we have the opportunity or the funding for improvements. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Pugh. Uh, next up, we have uh, Mr. Kent Sulem, and then on deck, we have Peter McLaughlin. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I'm Kent Sulem with the Minnesota Association of Townships, and I'm here to express our willingness to keep working on this bill, but to unfortunately have to say that we cannot support it in its current format. Uh, there is no direct, there, there's just a little bit of indirect funding coming back to the town roads. Our needs are estimated to be over $20 million a year above and beyond our current rates. We have 56,000 miles of roads, 13,000 bridges, <clears throat> I'm sorry, 6,000 bridges of the 13,000 bridges in the state. Uh, it's more than any other road authorities, more than the state and uh, most of the others combined, and yet uh, we are very underfunded in this bill at this current time, and so we look forward to working with the author. We know that there's very tough parameters to work with, but we simply need to get more money to the rural roads. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sulem. Uh, next up, uh, Peter McLaughlin on deck, uh, Bob Carney. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, <coughs> excuse me, and members. <coughs> I, uh, I am Peter McLaughlin. I am uh, Hennepin County Commissioner and Chair of the County's Transit Improvement Board, the Five County Joint Powers Board that was authorized by the legislature in 2008 to expand transit investment in the state to, and to, uh, in particular, to expand the major busways and uh, light rail transit lines. I appreciate the chance to uh, speak to the committee today. Uh, I, I have come from a legislative background. I was a member in, of the House back in the 80s and have been on the county board since. And I, in my experience, these major transportation bills need to address both uh, roads and <coughs> transit if they're going to be successful. Uh, I, I actually, I would echo the comments from Mr. Shetton that the bill really uh, does put a significant hole in the uh, in the budget of Metro Transit for buses, and that uh, that that is a, a step backward and doesn't doesn't address the the problems of Metro mobility, the, the cost of which are going up very dramatically because of the aging population. Uh, we've been trying as the county's transit improvement board to get the states reduce the state's role in the capital contributions to the LRT projects and the big busway projects. We have been thwarted in that effort by Dakota County and their refusal to go along with uh, the dissolution of the county's transit improvement board. Uh, we've been disappointed in that. Uh, the provisions in this bill I think that are most difficult for us relating to uh, transit investment would be the the elimination of any state contribution to any light rail transit operations in the future. That's in 2021. That's when the Southwest project would come on board. 
there's been concern about uh, uncertainty surrounding transit investment, this bill would create more uncertainty uh, because of the, the pullback by the state in making a modest contribution under $14 million a year uh, starting in 2021, so far in the future, but this is creating uncertainty. There's a myth about light rail that it's inefficient. Let me just give you quick numbers on this. Two minutes. 20, okay. Light rail transit has been uh, incredibly efficient. 28% of all the riders in the metro transit system, 21% of the operating costs. We think it's a good investment for the whole state of Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McLaughlin. Next up, uh, Mr. Bob Carney and on deck, Jessica Treat. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Bob again, Carney Jr., uh, Minneapolis registered lobbyist for We the People. Uh, I'm kind of here for the alternative facts rebuttal to Commissioner and CTIB Chair McLaughlin. Uh, and I do want to say that I, uh, I, I really appreciate that Mr. McLaughlin uh, has been willing to, to talk with me and uh, make short video statements and engage, although we very strongly disagree on this issue. Uh, but uh, I'm pleased to see that there's a provision in the bill to take a look at what can be done with Metro Mobility. Uh, to coordinate it with uh, other entities. I hope that is going to be constructed to read uh, to include Uber and Lyft. Uh, I'm a little distressed to see that it's kind of the same usual group. I, I'd be happy to serve on that task force if you can figure out a way to, to uh, make a provision for that. Uh, regarding the alternative facts, uh, you know, the uh, Metro Council uh, and, uh, uh, did a presentation at the House uh, and I believe they did the same presentation here, uh, showing the plan from now until 2040. They're planning on spending $31.2 billion on what they call transit, and that includes what I call giant construction boondoggles. Uh, that is compared to about $50 billion that's planned for all roads and bridges spending in the Twin Cities during the same time period. When you actually look at the total cost, operating and capital, they talk about 30% for fare box recovery. It's actually 15%. When these systems were private back in the 50s and 60s, it was 100% by definition. If you looked at shutting down the entire system and replacing it with Uber, I'm not proposing this, I'm using it as a benchmark. Uh, you have to take a look at the, the fact that the per mile cost for running the whole system would be comparable, except Uber's trying to reduce their cost. They're Two trying minutes. to you have use to wrap it up, automated please. systems. We need to look ahead at what we can do with the 21st century and the technology that it offers. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carney. Next up, Ms. Street. Hi, thank you, Chair, and thank you, members of the committee, for allowing us the chance to speak. Uh, my name is Jessica Treat. I am the Executive Director of Transit for Livable Communities and St. Paul Smart Trips. As the largest transportation advocacy nonprofit in the state, we represent thousands of Minnesotans who support expanding options for transit, walking, biking, and sharing. We also lead Transportation Forward, a broad statewide coalition calling for new investments in all modes of transportation to improve mobility, economic health, and quality of life in communities across Minnesota. While we, while we are glad to see there are no cuts to the base funding for metro, trans, metro area transit, now is not the time to stand still. This bill does not address the urgent needs for additional funding to serve people who rely on transit in our region and our state. Minnesotans of all ages and abilities should be able to easily reach the destinations that are critical to their everyday lives, their work, their doctor, their school, their grocery store, and increasingly they want and need more options for getting where they need to go. With these Minnesotans in mind, I urge you to increase funding for bus and rail transit and for all modes of transportation statewide. Standing still on funding serves to put us further behind in meeting the mobility needs of our seniors, our families, our employees and workers, and communities of color and our other neighbors across our metro area and throughout Minnesota. Standing still will result in cuts to bus service. That's not doing right by Minnesotans, especially in a time of budget surplus. Our state's prosperity today and into the future is tied to how Minnesotans can connect to opportunity. Please do right by Minnesota today and into the future and take us forward rather than backward. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Treat. With that, that concludes our testimony, uh, our testifiers today. So with that, I'll turn it back to the author, Senator Newman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I don't think that I'm gonna take the time to, to respond to the 20-some testifiers. I mean, I, I'm not surprised by any of them. Uh, and all of them have, have raised good points. Uh, but as with 
uh, so many omnibus bills, the problem really is, is not only how much money are we going to spend, but where are we going to get it from. Uh, the gist of this bill uh, is to uh, statutorily rededicate sales tax. Uh, many of the testifiers have requested that we provide them with some kind of dedicated funding. Uh, it isn't in w within my uh, authority or power to provide a uh, constitutionally dedicated funds in this bill. So uh, I went with the other alternative, which is statutorily dedicated funds. The other uh, thing that you know repeatedly came up is is the uh, absence of transit or an increase in the transit funding. And I just want the members to understand, uh, I do not oppose transit. Uh, but the current uh, uncertainty that is swirling around transit in the state of Minnesota makes it, at least in my mind, very, very, a very, very difficult issue to address. And when I say the uncertainty, I'm talking about uh, what's going on at the federal level. Uh, we do not know uh, at this point what, if anything, the feds are going to do. Um, there certainly is the controversy uh, swirling around Southwest Light Rail. That's pretty obvious. And frankly, any future uh, light rail projects. But to me, the biggest problem that we as a committee face is what is going to happen with CTIP. And I don't think there's anyone in this room that knows what's going to happen with CTIB. And whatever they do, whether it, whether it dissolves or whether it remains in place, it will have an effect on uh, what we do in the future as far as transit. So uh, to me, the, the, the timing to address transit is wrong. We're going to try and address transportation in this bill. Uh, but ha as I have indicated in... Uh, in other hearings, uh, I'd be more than willing to take up whatever discussion uh, the members want to next year on uh, the transit issue. Uh, and hopefully by then we'll have a little bit better of an understanding as to what kind of a problem we are facing. Uh, so with that, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I, I suppose at this point uh, entertain uh, discussion from the members and uh, any potential amendments that members may wish to offer. Thank you, Senator Newman. Senator Dibble. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Senator Newman, I just wanted to pick up on your, uh, your uh, comments ab about transit. I just want to ask a, a very simple question of you. Um, do you um, regard transit as somehow um, something that can be left to the side, that is optional, that is not a fundamental part of our transportation system, um, that uh, people who otherwise don't have options available to them um, uh, in terms of mobility, their you know, need to get to um, school, to get to a job, uh, get to their place of worship, be able to stay in their house if they're a senior citizen. Um, do, you, do you think it's fine to just just uh, address the needs of folks who have the ability to own and drive a car and just leave everyone else who has mobility needs on the basis of age or um, disability or income to the side just to be forgotten about? I mean, do you, do you fundamentally believe that transit is just an extra add-on that can be addressed at a future point in time and it's okay to, to pass a roads-only bill? Senator Newman. Sincere question. It is a fair question. And, and, uh, and I, I, I hope I'm going to be able to give you a very succinct and very direct answer, and the, and the answer is no. I do not regard uh, transit in that respect. Uh, there are people that need public transportation. There are people in Senator Dibble in your district, which is a metropolitan area, and there are folks in my district, which is deeply rural, that need transportation. Uh, probably a little more difficult even in the rural areas to provide public transportation, but it is, it's absolutely necessary, and I, I readily agree that, uh, that it is. Um, it's, it's like transportation, however, it's very expensive, and I, and I do wish to address it, but how do we address uh, transit 
at this stage of the game, knowing that there are a number of members, for instance, at, at, in this committee, that genuinely and deeply support light rail. And there are members that genuinely and deeply oppose it. We do not have a consensus on light rail. And I think that's one of the linchpins to the issue re revolving around transit. Uh, I have been very public in my opposition to light rail, uh, simply because of the inflexibility and the cost. Uh, and I know, Senator Dibble, you don't agree with me on that, uh, but we are entitled to our respective positions. But to cast uh, you know, me in a light where I oppose transit and I don't want to take care of those who do not have the ability to drive a car, uh, that is not my position at all. I think that we have some pretty basic questions that we have to address when it comes to transportation, or I'm sorry, transit. And uh, those are some really critical areas that I think there's a great deal of uncertainty to right now. And uh, for that reason, I have chosen to just try to maintain the status quo. And I am hoping that maybe by next year we'll have a little bit more certainty in this area and we'll go forward from there. But I will tell you, Senator Dibble, that uh, I will be very amenable to a discussion and to uh, hear bills next year that will perhaps address the transit issue. Uh, I've already, for instance, told Senator Franzen that I was open to new ideas. I think she has a bill that is, uh, I think it's a mileage tax. and. Uh, Senator Franzen is going to get a hearing on that next year so we can talk about a mileage tax. And there's great opposition to it and there's great support for it. I intend to do the same thing when it comes to transit. Follow up, Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Newman, um, well, um, you are named as the chief author of Senate File 1060. Your, your name is on the bill as the chief author. You have to, you have to stand up and defend this bill in this committee. You have to shepherd it through the Finance Committee. You have to uh, stand up and defend it on the floor of the Senate. Your name is inextricably bound <clears throat> to uh, everything that's in that bill. In that bill is nothing that supports any form of transit whatsoever. Sure, there are conversations that are swirling around outside of this building, um, and you say, um, you want to hold the status quo and, and you don't know how to deal with uncertainty. Well, you're doing nothing to contribute to any resolution of the uncertainty. A, B, you're doing nothing in this bill to address um, the deficit that's been well articulated uh, by the Metropolitan Council on more than one occasion uh, to this committee as well as in writing. So you are um, establishing some certainty and that is that um, those who rely on transit, whether in the metropolitan area or in greater Minnesota, are going to receive far less services. We know, of course, that metro mobility is a federally mandated service, and so that has to be kept whole. And so as a, as a consequence, just the regular local bus service in the metropolitan area is going to have to be cannibalized, approaching, we're going to have to reduce the level of service that we provide to people by a fifth. A fifth fewer buses, a fifth fewer routes. This is the backbone of the system. This is essential mobility for people who rely for their very lives on this form of, of, of transportation. Students and seniors and people with disabilities and those who are struggling to work, many of them working multiple minimum wage jobs just to make ends meet, spending hours trying to get around town on just the local bus service. Even if there's a fare increase of 25 cents or so, a reduction of approaching 20%, one fifth of the existing transit system. And your bill <laughs> offers nothing in the way of, of opportunity or solutions, much less responds to what we know to be the 
needs of the metropolitan area with the anticipated growth of up to 800,000 people and 500,000 jobs. So we'll get into the discussion about the lack of adequacy for even the road and bridge system in your bill. But even if we had all the money in the world, we couldn't build enough roads and bridges in the metropolitan area to accommodate that level of growing pressure. So we have to grow our transit system, which includes a component of transit ways, whether those are LRT or bus rapid transit or what have you. So we don't even begin to offer an idea or a place to convene around that. And Senator Newman, you know as well as I do that uh, in the metropolitan area, which is responsible for two-thirds of the gross domestic product in this state, we export a tremendous amount of money to support the highway and bridge infrastructure all around the state. I am happy to pay for a county road in a state highway up in the north, farthest reaches of northwestern Minnesota with my tax dollars that I'll never drive on uh, because that's important for the entire state to grow and prosper. This bill turns its back on the metropolitan area entirely, but it particularly heaps punishment and indignity on people who are struggling to maintain a toehold in participating in our economy and our larger life of the community. And your name is, is attached to this bill. You're going to have to defend that, Senator Newman. Senator Newman. Well, uh, I guess I, I have never uh, heard the, uh, that kind of a comment that my, my name is attached to a bill and uh, it's almost a, as a perceived threat uh, that I won't be able to defend the bill. Um, Senator Dibble, there are uh, monies that the constituents that I represent and tax money that I pay uh, that does in fact go into the transportation dollars that are allocated in this bill to transit in the metropolitan area. And I'll never ride on a bus. Uh, I've been on the train once. So I think uh, your comparison that you're happy to pay for roads that you'll never drive on, I think it's equally fair for me to say I help pay for transit that I, I don't use. Um, I, I am fully aware that uh, transit is not funded to the point uh, that it should be in this bill. But for the reasons that I have stated, and it doesn't make any difference how many ways you ask the question or how many times you ask the question, my answer is going to be the same is the uncertainty that is now swirling around the transit system in the state of Minnesota uh, just tells me that we cannot charge ahead and be funding something like Southwest Light Rail or uh, we don't know what's going to happen with CTIP. Uh, I feel as though that I am left in a position where I have to uh, take a real hard look at what the future holds, and right now I don't know what that is. Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much, Senator Newman. Uh, you and I met at the beginning of the session, and I said how much I was looking forward to working with you on transportation, and I still am. And I thank you for your time then and for putting work on this bill, which I know takes a lot. Your question for me that day was, could I think of any alternative sources of new revenue that would be superior in my view and the view of the people in my district to the gas tax? I promised you I would think about it, work on it, and if I saw a better source, that I would acknowledge it. I have not. As I look at the bill in front of us, my main concern is if we're going to take money out of the general fund to spend more on transportation, can we have a discussion about what we're going to take less out of the general fund for? And as I look at the hundreds of millions of dollars that are being diverted from the general fund, I cannot help but think of the Minnesotans who will be affected by that too. And as we go forward, I ask for you and everyone on the committee and everyone in the Senate to raise those questions and say, if there's less for this, where's there more? Are we robbing Peter to pay Paul? I'd also like to say um, that as far as the quarters of commerce provision, the Highway 14 partnership has some concerns. I believe their position is they are not able to support the bill at this time for um, a couple reasons. And as you know, Highway 14 is important to the people in my district. So as we go forward, I ask everyone to ask questions about the gas tax. I represent rural Nicollet County. The Minnesota corn growers support it. The Minnesota soybean growers support it. 
Minnesota Farmers Union support it. Greater Mankato Growths, um, our area chamber did a survey in which over 70% of the respondents, which included the Rochester Chamber of Commerce, said that they would consider a gas tax if it would help get Highway 14 done. There aren't that many people left in my district um, who haven't weighed in, and I just ask us to consider it as the bill goes forward that what we're really looking for is new revenue, and I think there's ways to improve it. Having said that, I look forward to the rest of the journey with you, and I do know it takes a lot of work, and I want to thank you for it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Newman. Thank you, Senator Friends. Uh, regarding the, the, the gas tax, uh, there are, without question, groups out there that do favor an increase in the gas tax. Uh, there are also an awful lot of our constituents that do not. Uh, I have believed for years that we have got a spending problem, not a tax problem. And I have believed that. I have been very consistent on that. Uh, you know, in round numbers, Senator Friends, uh, we spend $80 billion biennium. And uh, we cannot seem to come up with enough money to fix our roads and do the transit that, that we need. Uh, so number one, before I'm willing to support a gas tax increase, uh, somebody's gonna have to convince me that the money isn't already in the system, and there's a lot of money in the system. Uh, as far as the gas tax itself, it's, you know, in some respects, it, it reminds me of the general school formula that was put together back in the 70s. It's out of date. Uh, the world has changed enormously since uh, folks begun, began coming up with this uh, way to fund transit or transportation with a gas tax. Uh, we, we've got electric cars. We have got cars now that are very efficient compared to when I was a kid. Uh, we have got uh, mass transit that supposedly takes cars off the road. Uh, to have a discussion on uh, the gas tax center, friends, I'll have that with you at any time. Uh, but I have, as of right now, I am not satisfied uh, that uh, simply increasing the gas tax without increasing efficiencies and, and looking at how we go through the project selection process with MnDOT. Until we do those kinds of things, uh, I would be uh, pretty firmly against any increase in the gas tax. Senator Kent. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, First, I want to um, just follow up some on the conversation about transit, and I don't want to single you out, Senator Newman. Um, even though you did this, others do this as well. <clears throat> it's about our language, and transit gets treated as outside of transportation, and I think it is fundamentally important that we remember that transportation is not separate from transit, and transit is not separate from transportation. It is just like our ports, just like our rails, just like our roads and bridges, just like bike and pedestrian. Those are ways that people get around in our communities, and we need to remember that, and those, that language is important. People need to remember that transit is part of Minnesota's transportation system. Um, and, and I just want to respond a little to your um, comments with, about the approach that this bill takes in terms of not addressing any new needs or f resources for transit. Um, that it's, it, it's sort of taking an all or nothing position. And if we, we can make the, have the discussion and say we've got some concerns and questions about how things are going to uh, come out regarding CTIB, how things are transpiring from the federal level, particularly with regard to some of the, the transit ways. But we still have a fundamental problem that we are leaving our regular route bus service and metro mobility in a serious deficit situation. And so here we are in a budget year. We can't really, likely, we can't assume that we're going to be able to do anything about that next year. Um, this is our time to address the shortcomings, that, the shortfalls that we have in our regular route bus service in the metropolitan area. And, you know, if you look at my community where every time they open up a new express bus line, whether it's to downtown St. Paul or downtown Minneapolis, it is instantly filled. 
And um, if we are to lose 25% of the lines of the, of the routes we have right now, that is a big problem. And then multiply that around communities throughout our, throughout our metropolitan area. And so I appreciate that you say you're trying to maintain the status quo, but the reality is this bill does not do this. This bill, in terms of regular route bus service and metro mobility, takes us backwards. So it does not achieve the goal that you, that you say that is important to you. Um, and just one more comment on the transit side. Um, I was appreciative of, and I did not catch the testifier's name at the very end, um, talking about um, our state's prosperity and what this means. If we do not maintain our infrastructure, our transportation infrastructure, both in the metropolitan area and around Min greater Minnesota, I'm glad to hear Senator French bring up Highway 14, which even though it's not in my district, I recognize it is an important, literal corridor of commerce for the state of Minnesota, as are so many others around our state. And we all have to support those. But if we continue to shirk this responsibility and not do these things adequately, we are literally strangling our abilities to grow economically. And finally, when it comes to the, the um, comments you made that um, you have not yet been convinced that the money isn't already in the system, particularly specifically within the um, uh, area of roads and bridges, and concerns about the increasing of, efficient, of efficiencies in our road and bridge system. We have had testimony, um, and we have heard testimony for years. We specifically had testimony during this session um, demonstrating the many things that MnDOT has done to increase efficiencies, and we need to always continue to, to push on them to work harder at doing that. That is our absolute obligation to do that. Um, and to do better in project selection, selection, absolutely. We have taken steps over recent years to continue <coughs> forcing that. But in terms of convincing you that the money isn't already in the system, we just had 20 testifiers come up and talk about that very thing. The money that the state provides into our transportation system, the way that it trickles, it takes care of our state highway system, but it also trickles down into our counties, our cities, our townships. When we don't do that, those costs fall on individuals, those costs fall on us as property taxpayers and through our counties and our cities. and. Um, I, I'm just not sure what it will take to convince you that the money is not in the system when we have heard this, and I think in such a compelling way, from every single corner of our state, um, and from engineers to um, all sorts of advocates throughout our state. So um, I, I um, appreciate what you've done. I know you've put a ton of work into this bill, um, but I am deeply troubled that we are not meeting the standards that we need to meet in terms of taking care of just maintaining our roads and bridges, let alone the kinds of um, strategic expansions and improvements we need to be making. And as a result, this bill not only doesn't make things better, by neglect, it will make things worse. Thank you. Senator Kiffmeyer, oh, I'm sorry, Senator Newman, respond. Yeah, I'm just going to uh, respond very quickly. Uh, Senator Kent, thank you for those comments. Uh, I, I just want to point out two things. Uh, when I talk about the money in the system, I'm not talking about just the transportation system. I'm talking about our overall budget. I'm talking about the fact that the state of Minnesota has about five and a half million people and we spend about $80 billion in a biennium across all of our state agencies. That's what I'm talking about. And um, that's where I am not convinced that of that roughly $80 billion that we are spending, uh, it's all being spent in the wisest and the best manner. I don't tend to look at our state budget in a silo of transportation money versus education money versus public safety money. I think it, we start out with the taxpayers of this state putting all the money into a pot and it gets divvied up from there. Uh, as to your comment, Senator Kent, about uh, tra transit, you know, the language that I'm using and, and transit being outside uh, uh, or an outlier, uh, I apologize. That's not what I meant. When I think in terms of transportation funding sources, I am talking about transit and transportation, that's what I am referring to. Transit and transportation are uh, of co-equal value to the state of Minnesota in the Transportation Finance and Policy Committee. 
Next up, uh, Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And so in regards to this conversation about transit, uh, so often it's used as a very large generic word when actually there is bus rapid transit, there's light rail transit, um, there's local transit, uh, there's a whole variety of things, but yet the one word is used for that. So I'm very grateful, Senator Newman, that next year, I think it is time for us to take a look at all of these areas in balance with one another. Also, when you mention the new things that are coming, um, there are things on the, the, things are moving so fast. There are things out there that, and the speed at which they are being adopted, whether it's the Uber cars, um, and just most recently in the automated vehicle, uh, driverless type vehicle situation that share roads with us. And so there are, many forms, electric powered bicycles instead of purely human powered bicycles. There are things out there. We need to make sure that when we are dealing with the concept of transportation and transit in that area like that, that we have a comprehensive look and make sure that we don't go spending dollars now that in the future we will regret because we didn't think of <coughs> some of the things that are yet on the horizon. So I'm just hoping and thinking about that in the future, Senator Newman, I think that's a very wise approach to take in regards to this burgeoning area of transit in general. So thank you very much for that. Uh, next up, Senator Westrom and then Senator Franzen. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, <clears throat> would it be uh, appropriate to uh, offer an amendment at this point in time? I'm sorry, go ahead. Would it be appropriate? Offer amendment? Offer. I'd move the A15 amendment if I could. Okay. Get that passed out. Mr. Chair, while, while it's being passed out, uh, I'll just uh, uh, explain it um, uh, in the interest of time. Members, uh, this is... Uh, this is the uh, language in the bill that we heard in front of the committee uh, re regarding um, allowing uh, additional uh, overweight or extra weight on uh, uh, semis uh, for the purpose of hauling construction materials or aggregate uh, largely related to uh, road, road building and construction of uh, roads uh, that were uh, so focused on in this committee. Uh, members, uh, I would ask for your support uh, real briefly in the amendment uh, to recap the bill for you. Uh, rather than starting in July 1st uh, of this year, we uh, would, would set it up for February 1st of next year, uh, giving uh, local authorities uh, any, any time they may uh, want to uh, post roads, which we allow in the language of the bill. Uh, there would be an additional fee for uh, this uh, permit that uh, matches what already currently uh, Minnesota allows in some, uh, some uh, products, uh, timber and ag products uh, are two uh, examples uh, um, that currently already are allowed on the road at uh, higher than 80,000 pounds. Uh, but key in this, uh, this language, uh, first of all, if a vehicle, a semi is going to go up to uh, 90,000 pounds, it would need to add a sixth axle. And if they're going to the 97,000, they would have to have a seventh axle. Uh, distributing the weight, uh, adding braking capacity to the to the uh, vehicle, and uh, like I said, we already allow this on uh, other products hauled in the state. The other thing, uh, members, to keep in mind in the winter, we uh, have special permits that allow many products during the time that the roads are frozen to uh, go up to 88,000 pounds already. So uh, by and large, there are lots of products across the state that are doing this. But uh, I would encourage us to uh, adopt this in, and uh, but it would be limited to just construction project, projects. To recap the testimony, uh, if you recall, a few weeks back, uh, on the Metrodome uh, demolition alone, this would have uh, reduced the, the number of semis uh, between, uh, if I'm recalling correctly, uh, 40 to 50,000 loads. Um, members, uh, no, I think there was 50,000 loads hauled out. This would reduce it down to 40,000, as I recall the testimony. Uh, you'll also recall the testimony uh, 
one example of a project on Highway 23 out in central Minnesota. Uh, just adopting this would uh, have reduced the cost of that project about four and a half percent on uh, the bid for uh, the cost of hauling uh, projects uh, products from the from the gravel pits to the to the roads and uh, and back and forth. And so, uh, members, our roads already uh, have these uh, weights on them. We add additional axles. There'd be an additional fee of $300 or $500, respectively, if uh, it's a six axle versus seven axles. That money would go to the local bridge account uh, to help uh, pay for inspections and bro uh, posting of br bridges. It keeps the local authorities in charge of uh, uh, posting uh, areas where they may have uh, problems or weight limit concerns, and uh, they can they can uh, designate the routes. And so, uh, members, I would ask for your support uh, for this uh, common sense change and to help uh, bring the cost of road building down uh, when when we uh, we know there's so much uh, cost that goes into it just hauling the aggregate and the products uh, to the road that th that's being built. And so uh, I would uh, ask for your support on, on this amendment. Senator Newman, as I will with all amendments today, I'll ask your comments on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the, the one question I would have would be for Ms. Boyd. Uh, beginning at line 2.6 through 2.8, there is a, a revenue portion uh, where revenue from the permits uh, will be deposited into a bridge, town bridge count. I don't know what the, what the revenue is, uh, and it's going to be av uh, made available to inspect and post weight limits on town bridges. Ms. Boyd, is there a fiscal uh, a consideration in the A15 amendment that will put our, uh, uh, that will put uh, the A13 amendment out of balance. Ms. Boyd. Mr. Chair and Senator Newman, there is a fiscal note completed on the underlying um, bill of this amendment that was Senate File 1063, Senator Newman's bill, or I'm sorry, Senator Western's bill. Um, there are some slight differences between that language and this amendment, chiefly being the effective date. But the fiscal note for the underlying bill shows revenue of approximately $500,000 Let's see, I just want to double check that. Approximately $500,000 a year to the town bridge account, and that um, would also be appropriate, so that's also an expenditure from the, from the uh, amendment. And then there will be some slight cost to the trunk highway fund um, in the Department of Transportation related to additional staff time and system changes um, of about 71,000 in the first year. I assume that would be reduced because of the delayed effective date and in subsequent years costs of $36,000 from the Trunk Highway Fund. Since the um, Senate file 1060, the A13 amendment does not spend down the Trunk Highway Fund to anything close to a zero balance. This would not significantly affect, um, we would not have to change the spending in the, in the uh, A13 amendment and does not affect the general fund target at all. Senator Newman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Boyd. Uh, with that information, um, uh, members, I, will, I would say that I do not oppose it, uh, uh, the, uh, the amendment uh, as offered. Senator Dibble. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, just a quick question for Senator Newman about a question that he asked about. Um, you, you had asked if... Uh, if the A15 puts the, uh, the delete everything, the A13 out of, out of balance. What, what were you referring to specifically? Senator Newman. By in balance, out of balance. What I'm uh, specifically referring to is, is uh, uh, we have a limited amount of money that we can spend out of the general fund, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, the A13 amendment does in fact spend. Uh, and I am concerned that we would be spending money out of that general fund uh, that is not accounted for in the bill. So, follow up, Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, and I and I appreciate that, and I respect uh, your effort to keep your budget uh, uh, to the to the targets um, that that you've been given by by your leadership. Um, um, should a I don't, I, don't, I don't know what's coming up in future amendments, but um, there may be future amendments that are quote out of balance, um, which you are. Uh, I think well within your rights to oppose for that reason, but um, I just want to be clear that that those aren't um, amendments that are out of order because 
there, there are no, there is no um, standard to which we need to hold in terms of spending, in terms of whether or not we can discuss and vote on the merits of any spending proposal. We could spend two billion more dollars today um, if we saw fit to do so without being in violation of the rules. I just want to establish that for clarity and for the record. Senator Newman. Yeah, thank you, Senator Dibble, and, and, and I, I am aware of that. Uh, I think that you will find me uh, somewhat resistant to uh, changes in the funding mechanism uh, in the A13 amendment, but I would also ask you to please keep in mind that uh, uh, if assuming the bill leaves here, it goes to the full finance committee, I understand it will be heard on Monday, and I would be more than happy to visit with any member between now and Monday regarding a, a, or an amendment that I am concerned about when it comes to the finances. Thank you. Other comments on the amendment? If not, hearing none, no. Senator Dibble. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, just a, a question to the, to the maker of the amendment. Um, uh, Senator Westrom, um, I recall that uh, um, a, a number of, of groups um, uh, were not in support of this idea when it was heard earlier by this committee. Have any changes been made to the to this um, proposal that would cause them to be more supportive or have they indicated their support, the county engineers, uh, some of the others? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Dibble, um, uh, the, the language is the same other than uh, we push it out to February 1st of 2018. Uh, and, and still allow, I, I'd repeat, uh, allow local uh, posting of bridges. Uh, that was one of their concerns, but uh, I, I wouldn't, I, nothing, nothing to my knowledge has changed, uh, changed uh, their position uh, either way. Okay. Senator Dibble, follow up. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, in, in light of that information, um, you know, and, and, and the reasons that were articulated by, by those organizations, of course, they fear for safety issues. We heard from our public safety uh, community, uh, some of which, some of whom are represented here in the room today. Uh, we heard for our local, from our local officials who are responsible for the upkeep and, and maintenance on behalf of our local property taxpayers, um, uh, uh, their, their concerns, um, you know, the reasons that I articulated uh, during that hearing um, we had asked the, to, to wait on this subject until we heard back from uh, the national studies. They came back and, and recommended that no changes like this be made. We know, of course, that interstates uh, still have the limitations, and so there wouldn't be, even be the option for trucks this heavy to go on our, on our interstate system uh, within the state. Um, I would continue to be uh, opposed uh, to this idea. The, the wear and tear and the safety issues just simply haven't been uh, proven yet, as, as was evidenced by the GAO study that was mandated by the FAST Act, or not the FAST Act, the predecessor, MAP 21. Um, so uh, I, would, I would encourage a no vote, and Mr. Chair, I'd like to request a roll call. Thank you, Senator Dibble. Also, uh, just procedurally, and I apologize, before we have to actually, after you remove the A15 amendment, we need to move the A13 originally to get it started before we can actually add the amendments, I believe. So, Senator Newman, do you wish to move the A13? Uh, I okay. do. So, I'm sorry. So Senator Western, you need to remove your A15 amendment request, and then we'll re-establish re that. Mr. Chair, I'll uh, withdraw my A15 uh, amendment temporarily. Thank you. Senator Newman. I move the uh, A13 amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Motion passes. Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, I'd uh, offer uh, the, uh, move the A15 amendment. Okay, the A13 amendment is moved. Any more discussion? A15, I'm sorry. A15. Mr. Any more discussion on the A15? Senator Dibble. I'll renew my request for a roll call. Okay. Roll call requested, roll call granted. Senator Senjum. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, on, uh, on the strong uh, uh, advice and urging of my townships, my city, my counties, and actually in consultation with the, the largest concrete hauler in, in my city this morning who said he didn't need it, uh, I'll be voting no. Thank you. Anyone else? With that, we'll take the roll call. <coughs> Newman? 
Aye. Anderson? Aye. Carlson? No. Dibble? No. Franzen? No. Frentz? No. Hall? Yes. Jasinski? Aye. Jensen? Aye. Kent? No. Kiffmeyer? Aye. Little? No. Osmick? Yes. Senjum? No. Westrom? With the vote being A in favor, seven being against, the motion pass is approved. Further discussion? Senator Carlson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think it's my, my comments uh, really are on the, the overall uh, acceptability of this bill. Um, almost all the testifiers that we heard, uh, even those that had some favorable parts in the bill, still felt that there were shortcomings. And I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, if we do pass it out of this committee, that there's still some work that can be done on those shortfalls. I hear your concerns about the, that the state spends too much. Uh, however, our budget history has shown that uh, we have had several administrations that have not been able to stay within the spending that, that uh, has been brought forward with these budgets and we've had to borrow from schools, we've had to uh, pawn off the uh, tobacco settlement, we've had to sweep accounts. So there's a, a larger problem there and those, those particular uh, agencies that have to get this budget are the ones that are going to have to make the decisions on what programs they're going to have to cut. And that's something that I don't know that it's really fair for us to mandate uh, as a committee here that someone else has to cut their committee or their, um, uh, their agency or the managers in their departments. That's like mandating a Sophie's Choice. We should be telling them what should be cut. So I, I can't say that I agree with, I mean, I, I can't say that I disagree that maybe the state spends too much, but I think also that we have to be specific when we're asking other people to cut and we're actually not going to fund what I think most of the testifiers say is needed in transportation. So I, I think uh, our revenue, the road revenues we collect are fair. I think they're, they are dedicated and compared with some of the, uh, our peer states, they're actually now, especially the gas tax is actually below average and it's sinking because more states in the last year have raised their gas taxes. Gas taxes are the purest user fee that we have. And I think we have to keep that in mind whenever we talk about gas taxes, even though no one likes to pay additional taxes, this is one that people have been asking for because it's dedicated, it dedicated constitutionally, and it's fair, it's easy to collect, it doesn't add more government to collect it, and I think we, we need to always keep those things in mind. And I know there are groups that do favor gas tax increases. They weren't up and uh, testifying today, but they've told me in the background that yes, they do favor increased gas taxes like has been happening in our peer states. So thank you, uh, Senator Newman for bringing this. And I'm hoping that we can have a, a little larger um, conversation about where our roads should, where and how our roads should be financed. Thank you. Okay, and just a procedural, uh, we are gonna continue here until 12.45. I know we believe uh, some people that need to go to judiciary. Uh, so we'll continue until 12.45 if we can't vote by that time. We will continue this evening at 7 p.m. at the Capitol in room G15. Uh, with that, Senator Franzen. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Newman. I don't even know where to begin, but I'll begin with the facts. There is no new revenue in this bill. There's shifts, and with all due respect, there's gimmicks of illusions that we are increasing funding for transportation when we are indeed moving money from different sources that are already coming in, putting them in to this, the transportation bill that you presented to us, and we're expected to really fill in the gap that we know exists in funding. So with just with that, I, I, I can't uh, begin to start to support a bill like this. 
um, with all due respect, it's a budget year and you're in the majority and you're a chair of a committee and if uh, you have concerns about having enough funding already in the system, we'll go fight for it because it's needed. We all here for the most part, the majority of the people who testified today are clamoring for that. And you have the leadership, the power as a chair and in the majority to fight for that new funding. I've supported tax revenue, new tax revenue, different, uh, different controversial ways of being creative to fund that gap. But keeping the status quo is, is really neglectful, not only for the people on the roads, but the citizens we serve in Minnesota. And I've served on Health and Human Services for four years. And there's 60,000 Minnesotans who are turning 65 every year. I hope all of them can drive until they're 90 to get to their medical appointments, but I know my district has heavily, uh, heavy uh, senior population, and it's only gonna increase in all of our districts, including yours, including Senator Dibbles, and I'm concerned. You said you're not gonna look at a budget in silos. We shouldn't, because the money that we're taking away from other parts of the budget, which I'm sure it's coming from Health and Human Services, because it's usually the first place we cut, and it's coming to shift into transportation, it's doing Minnesotans a disservice. We need to be creative, to be fiscally responsible and prudent, to find ways to solve this. But frankly, we don't need another study. And I'm looking through the bill of what came um, to finally in, in your proposal. There's studies on construction costs, studies on uh, weights and, and, and bridges and limits, things that have already been in place that we know are deficient, that we know need more, uh, more attention. Report, um, the tolling report that you have. I'm open to those things, but I'm, I'm kind of tired of reports. I'm tired of reports and I want action. And I think most Minnesotans expect us to take action. And to wait two more years for another biennium, two more years of more expensive construction costs, two more years of more crashes, two more years of more neglect is only gonna cost us more. We know that, it's a fact, it's not an illusion. And it frustrates me. This is my fifth year in the Senate, fifth year in this committee. I've heard it over and over and over again. And yes, I'm passionate about it because where's our action? We keep making a political statement about transportation when you know that people are hurting and, and, and dying in our roads for being um, unsafe. And we keep kicking the can down the road. And I just can't understand why we can't come together as a body and deal with this simple issue. I know we have other differences. Maybe Southwest Light Rail is one of those that will just never agree. But even that, the mechanisms in place in this bill dismantle the entire system for future rail, future transit, blue line, green line. And I don't think that's the direction we wanna go. When the house ceiling and roof is falling, we either you know, fix it, make the investments, but we can't let it fall down. And that's what we're doing with this bill. And again, I, I understand where some senators are in, in adamant disapproval or disagreement um, with Southwest Light Rail. But in my view, that ship has sailed. We've already committed to it. And you mentioned uncertainty. Well, we have always had uncertainty with the federal government. We don't control that at the state level. But we have certainty here as leaders, and you have certainty as the chair of a committee to really set the way for things to move forward. Even if they're controversial, if they're the right things for Minnesota. And you're never gonna have a project that's gonna be completely 100% supported. That's just impossible, that's an illusion as well. But I represent a district which every single part of the line that touches or serves is in support of this bill. Maybe not Hutchinson because Southwest does not go there. But if you represent in my district and your mayors and your chambers of commerce are telling you please support it, I, I believe you probably have, give it a second view. I know Senator Osmick doesn't have Southwest light rail or maybe doesn't believe in rail, but that's his prerogative. I think we need to listen to those who are supportive because they know what they're talking about. They've done the economic analysis, the, the economic development impact in our communities, which is good for all Minnesota, not just metro, not just suburban. It's good for the entire state. We know we pay more in taxes in the metro than in greater Minnesota. And again, I am fine with that. I ride to the cabin. I use those rural roads too. 
This is about the entire system and to leave an integral part of, of the system out to two more years when we have another budget discussion is a disservice and you are in control of that certainty. And I'm begging you to reconsider, to listen to the people that were speaking today. And frankly, we can make this bill in, in a lot better and bring certainty to transportation dollars and accountability, I'm all for that. I don't mind using some general fund money. But again, I've said on health and human services and the needs are growing. Our population is getting older. Those needs are growing. That is not an opinion, that's a fact. And they cost more. We're living longer. So let's make a real policy analysis about that. And this is not a political analysis. Let's make a policy analysis of why it's prudent investments to actually make this bill better and really stop being neglectful to our crumbling infrastructure. And if you don't believe that, Go out to your rural counties and talk to your civil engineers, nonpartisan. They tell you some of the roads are turned into gravel because they can't afford to keep paving them. And that's not the direction we want to go. Regardless of what you think of uh, trains or other modes of transportation that we have yet even to um, consider here in Minnesota, like driverless uh, vehicles, Let's be open-minded about how we can be efficient, how we can be innovative, not only in our transportation modes, but in our funding. And I think Minnesotans will understand if we actually are true to the need and true to the investments that require those needs to be met. Thank you. Senator Newman. Mr. Chairman. Senator Franz, and I'll just comment, and I'm, my comments are gonna be exceedingly brief. Uh, in in terms of uh, your statement that there's no new money in the tra this transportation bill, that isn't true. There's over a billion dollars of new money in transportation in this bill. There isn't any new money in terms of uh, new taxes that we have extracted out of our citizens on top of and above what we already tax them on. But there is no, there is new money in this bill. Uh, your comment to me that I'm in the majority and I'm in control and, uh, and that I should be doing something. I have been, in the, I have been the uh, chairman of this committee for two and a half months. You were in the majority for four out of the fifth years, five years that you've been here. So I would suggest maybe that we uh, just calm the rhetoric just a little bit and maybe try to work together rather than uh, cast the burden solely on me and the new majority who, is, who are in this position for the first time in four years. Uh, studies, I don't know that I have ever seen an omnibus bill in, in my career in the legislature that hasn't been full of studies. In point of fact, I want these studies done because I do not necessarily agree with the way MnDOT in particular is doing their project selection process. And I want that studied and I want to know uh, how they are going about it. I want to know how they are coming about their decisions on whether or not to fund turnbacks, because we have no information on that. So I don't see anything really uh, wrong with the studies that we have, uh, we have requested. And finally, on uh, Southwest Light Rail, there are folks in this room that are very committed to it. That isn't true of me. I've never been committed to, to Southwest Light Rail. And I don't know that the state of Minnesota, in terms of a legislature, has ever voted in favor of Southwest Light Rail. It is a light rail that has been uh, designed and discussed almost completely outside of the legislature. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Little. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a quick question before I give my comments. But Senator Newman, are you familiar with that game called Hungry Hungry Hippos? Have you heard of that one? <laughs> Senator Newman. <laughs> uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator Little, I am not. Okay. Senator Little. Uh, I think most, most folks uh, that had kids during the 90s are probably familiar with this game. Uh, it's a game where there's, there's, it's a, did you? 
I, I had no children born during the 90s. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you look damn good. So. Thank you for clarifying that, <laughs> Senator Newman. Uh, so it's a game where it's got a small board and hippos surround it, and the game starts by throwing a bunch of marbles into uh, this board, and then the people that are on this board start smashing a lever so that their hippo eats the marbles. And of course, the winner is the person that gets the most marbles at the end of the game. Uh, so that's how it feels to be a suburban legislature, except for the fact that the rules are a little different. If you're a suburban legislature, you step up to this hungry, hungry hippos game, you put your marbles in, and then you walk to the back of the room and watch everybody else play. Um, it's hard to win the game that way. Um, and so we always talk about this urban and rural divide, and left out of it are, are people that supply a heck of a lot of marbles for this state. Uh, and let me talk about three points in this bill that, that uh, show why that's true. The first is money for streets. Uh, suburbs. Uh, we uh, pretty much solely rely on property taxes uh, to make things run because uh, we don't get a whole lot of help from the state. And we do have a lot of roads uh, that aren't MSA eligible. And so uh, there's some money in this bill, a little bit of money for the small city account. Most suburbs are not going to uh, be able, eligible for that. Obviously, they're a little over the, the population limit. Uh, the second thing where we could be helped is the corridors of commerce. Uh, but a bunch of that, uh, that uh, new bonding is eaten up by specific projects, which happen to not be in the suburbs. Um, and then the last point is, is the, bus, the bus service, uh, especially for a, a city like Lakeville. We're at the end of the line. We're the last stop on, on, these, uh, on these routes. So if there's cuts to regular route bus service or bus service in general, I can, I can pretty much guarantee it's going to be the folks at the end of the line um, because it is a little uh, more inefficient because you're going farther out um, and you don't have the density as you move uh, through all the towns and cities. Uh, so suburbs uh, uh, really get left out of this bill and that's a big problem for me. Um, you know, I, I got to make a more poignant point. Um, you know, we talk, we talk about new money and, and uh, maybe new revenue and, and people are going to couch that in different ways. and. Uh, they're going to say it's it's new and it's not new, and and I get that. But uh, you know, we didn't really talk about new revenue uh, this uh, this session, and I and I think that is uh, a, a disappointment. Um, you know, the only uh, the only discussion we, that got close was this toll road study, uh, which I can just I can guarantee you that's not going to fly in this state. It's just not Minnesotan. Um, and so we didn't get to have that discussion, and, and I think we had time. I sat through a number of PowerPoints, and I'm an impatient person, uh, but that first month was PowerPoints, and, and that was good time we could have talked about some real issues. No one came here being, uh, you know, ignorant of the issues. You don't get here without being ignorant. So there was time to talk about these issues, um, even though it is a, a busy session. So that is a real disappointment to me. Um, and, I, and, and again, I'll, I'll repeat some of my statements. I don't think toll roads are a new idea or a creative idea or outside the box. Um, finally, I, I do want to talk about your comments uh, to uncertainty, uh, uh, Chair Newman. Um, I, I think uncertainty is a call for action and, and not inaction. Uh, people are relying on us to provide stability. And so there's a lot of people that are uncertain about whether they're going to have their bus route. They're uncertain about whether they're going to be able to get to their hospital visit. And, and that uncertainty uh, should, in all cases, uh, trump our hesitations here in, in taking some action. Because um, if, uh, if we wait for Congress to do something, I'll, I'll be a member of uh, AARP before that happens. And uh, that's a lot of years. So we've got to do something. Um, and I think we've had time to have these discussions. And the fact that we didn't is disappointing. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you, Senator Little. Uh, we're going to have two more testifiers. I'm going to let Senator Newman wrap up before we recess to this evening. So with that, we have Senator Osmick and Senator Senjum. Senator Osmick. Well, Senator Little, I want to correct you on something. Uh, you made a blanket statement that much metro cities may not benefit from the small city fund. St. Bonifacius will. Loretto will. Greenfield will. Greenwood will. Deep Haven will. Excelsior will, Spring Park will, Tonka Bay will, Monk Minnetonka Beach will, Long Lake will, Wyzetta will. So Senator Little making a blanket statement like that proves that 
there are inconsistencies and misperceptions, perhaps. Uh, small cities fund do help metropolitan districts, or dis metropolitan cities. Senator Little, to that point. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I didn't hear one city in my district, so uh, I think I, you know, I, I often speak for my district, so I, 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 I apologize if I have uh, um, uh, misspoken, and I'm, and I'm positive that $10 million will be more than enough to cover all those cities plus the small cities in our entire state. $10 million will be incredibly sufficient to fix the roads. Mr. Chairman. Senator Newman. I think, I think Senator Little was being just a tad sarcastic, but I, I do want to point out that uh, the $10 million that is appropriated for small cities is the only the second time that I am aware of that a fund of any kind has been appropriated for small cities. And the last time I think it was a number of years ago was, I think it was 12 million or 12 and a half million. Uh, and I think that has been for a number of years. So uh, small cities, I, I really believe, will be appreciative of the fact that they are, uh, that they are receiving some funding in this bill. Thanks, Senator Newman. Senator Senjum. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Newman, I want to thank you for bringing this bill forward. It, this is tough business. It's a lot of work. Uh, I think you've uh, done a, a good job of certainly leading us this year. And, and I, I just looking at the front page. Uh, we're talking here about uh, 2.9 billion in 2018, 2.9 billion in 2019. That, that, that's a lot of money. That, that's six billion dollars that we're putting out to transportation uh, in, over the next biennium in Minnesota. And make no mistake, it, it's not everything to everybody, but it is a lot of money going to a lot of places. And uh, certainly does have an emphasis on roads and bridges. Well, what's wrong with that? I mean, let's, let's just take care of one thing at a time. We all know we're, we've got deficiencies out there. Uh, let's kind of get by it and, and just go ahead and, and move forward. It's, 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 it's a lot of money. It's, it's a lot of pavement. It's a lot of concrete. And it's a lot of good. So I just want to tell you that and thank you for your leadership on this. It's a lonely job, not only putting this together or sitting up there today. It's a lonely job, I know it is. But I think you've, you've done it well and uh, I, I praise you for this bill and uh, hopefully we can move it forward and yeah, we can, we can have some conversation where we need to on certain issues, there's no question about that and I know you're that kind of a person. But uh, you know, six billion dollars going into transportation in Minnesota over the next couple of years is, is no small amount. And I think we, we just need to understand that. We understand, need to understand where it comes from. Taxpayers largely in Minnesota, sure there's some federal money in there, but uh, it's a lot of money and it's gonna do a lot of good. So with that uh, brush up, uh, <laughs> Mr. Chair, I have the A16 amendment. <laughs> That's the way to do it. <laughs> okay, with that, we'll distribute the A16 amendment. We'll quickly go through it. Again, we're going to try and wrap up by 12.45. Uh, so with that, we'll look at the A16 amendment. Senator Sanger, you want to explain while it's being distributed? Sure. Uh, Mr. Chair and, and uh, members, and specifically Senator Newman, we had a very, very brief conversation about this uh, prior to the meeting, and and I would just I would just tell you as uh, uh, if if you feel uncomfortable with it, we'll just set it aside. I would characterize it as a a, a fairly bland amendment. Uh, it it's one that does have to do with some testimony that we heard earlier with respect to active transportation, bicycle walking. Uh, mayors across Minnesota are fairly strong, well, fairly strong, they're strongly supportive of it. Uh, what this amendment does, uh, it, it sets into, at least statute, uh, a structure uh, relative to how uh, the MnDOT might accept and distribute money related to bicycle and walking trails in cities across Minnesota uh, if, that, if and when that money comes about. It's somewhat similar, uh, Mr. Chair and members, to what we did, uh, I think, in 2012 with the Safe Routes to School. We didn't initially fund that, but we set into, uh, into action at that point a, a structure for MnDOT to utilize and distribute that money. Uh, this would do the same. Uh, there, is a, there was a portion of this bill that, uh, that did, in fact, uh, encompass funding. It had to do with sales taxes on bicycles, bicycle parts, and 
related items. Uh, I, I took that out. But uh, what's left here is just a, uh, if you will, a, uh, an organizational and a financial infrastructure that would allow MnDOT, if and when money ever arrives at their door, to uh, assist cities in, in the funding of, of bike trails, walking trails, and so on. It would assist them then in terms of, of the statutory infrastructure for them to use to, to make that money uh, available to cities. It also creates a, an advisory committee uh, to help them in that process. So again, uh, depending on your level of comfort, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to push this one real hard on you, but if, uh, if you're reasonably comfortable, fine. If you're not, why, we can uh, set it aside. Senator Newman to the amendment. Senator Sengem, um I, I do recognize uh, the importance of bike trails and pedestrian trails sure. and so forth. But isn't there already in statute requirements of, for MnDOT to, in their planning uh, and design to accommodate, you know, bike trails and pedestrian ways when they're developing new roads? Or is this something different than that? Senator Sengem. Uh Mr. Chair and, and, and Senator Newman, my understanding is, and we could, I, I don't want to belabor this with a lot of testimony, but my understanding is that there is really not. Mr. Chairman. Senator Newman. Senator Sengem, is there, uh, I, I, I tend to be rather protective of the Trunk Highway Fund. Sure. Is there anything in this bill that would expose the Trunk Highway Fund to having to pay for any of what you are proposing? Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator members, uh, Senator Newman, I, uh, I don't, I, I think I can say there's not. Senator Newman, then Senator per, Dibble. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, go to Senator Dibble. Senator Dibble. I'm, d I'm listening and learning. Okay, Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Mr. Chair, um, and I thank you, Senator Sengen, for bringing um, this this forward. Um, I don't I don't know if we have time. I know Dorian Grelly is here. He can probably illuminate us because um, uh, this was uh, this language was uh, developed in conjunction with um, the coalition of folks who um, who advocate for these these sorts of things. Just uh, I would I would I would I would kind of support this. I would support this if there were actual money that were would, you know we would also be depositing into these funds um, that that would be established. Um, but the short version of, of, of what this um, provides for um, is, is really sta establishing a, a fund um, out of which um, uh, local units of government could compete for grants for the purpose of developing a local um, bike ped uh, infrastructure. Um, and it's somewhat apart and separate from the, the bicycle program yeah. that we discussed when I presented my bill that you've included in, generously in your bill, which may or may not force me to vote for your bill. We'll see. <laughs> um, uh, so, um, so this sets up uh, this sets up a, a, a fund. It sets up um, a, a process and criteria for um, establishing uh, grants to be made uh, from that fund uh, for the for the purpose of uh, helping local units of government um, to uh, build out uh, local bike ped infrastructure. I don't think it does interact with or take from. The Trunk Highway Fund. Um, you know, uh, part of me is a, is a little dubious um, because I wouldn't want us to represent if this were to go into the bill that somehow we've done something great uh, um, in terms of building out communities that function well and effectively uh, for all people um, because we haven't. We just established some some structures and that, and we haven't done anything real to fulfill the aspirations of what, because without, you know, money is policy, policy is money. This is policy, but no money, so it's kind of words on paper. But it's not a bad thing. <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Senator Newman. Uh, Senator Sengem, uh we are going to have to recess and come back tonight. Sure. Maybe between, uh, uh, if you would uh, uh, withdraw your amendment at this time, I'll, sure. I'll talk to you between now sure. and then and try and garner a little bit better understanding as to really what is in here and we'll go from there. If, if and Mr. Chair and, and Senator Newman, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't want you to step into this water without being comfortable. So uh, it's, uh, you know, okay. uh, that's where I'm at. And, and Before I wanna, we... Uh, I want to make sure you're comfortable or we just will defer it. Thank you, Senator Sanders. Okay. One last hand before we go. Uh, Senator Kiffmeyer. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just very quickly, I have a lot of concerns about this, reading through it quickly, but in particular, mentioning the Minnesota Constitution, Article 11, and making certain designations. Um, this is really uh, uh, concerning, and uh, I have questions about it in addition to starting a whole new program, but I'll look forward to this evening for further discussion. Thank you. Okay, uh, Senator Senjum, can you withdraw your uh, motion on the amendment until this evening, until we reconvene? Mr. Chair, I thought I did, but uh, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll reaffirm that if I didn't. Okay. <laughs> I might have missed that, sorry. <laughs> okay, with that, uh, just for information, all the information that's in front of you, please put in your packet or bring back the, for this evening. For tonight's meeting, we will reconvene at 7 p.m. in the Capitol at G, in room G15. Meeting stands in recess.